everyone, welcome to researchmd.com. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Pramil Chanath. I'm a physician. Um, I also, I'm in the United States. I'm a program director in internal medicine residency, transitional residency. I teach medical students and residents on a regular basis, director of research, assistant professor of medicine, two large medical school in the United States. Um, uh, today we got a great topic, very exciting topic. Okay, we've been doing a series of lectures on anemia. Uh, we did uh, microcytic anemia, we did macrocytic anemia, and uh, we've been looking at the hemolytic anemia. So in that hemolytic anemia, we did a, um, a presentation on uh, uh, hereditary elliptocytosis, then we did hereditary spherocytosis, and then uh, we also did uh, pyruvate kinase deficiency. Today our very exciting topic is about G6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with the definition. It's an X linked recessive disorder. What is the mean? Somebody tell me which is a common in male or female? Males. Male. Very common in male. That's what it is right here. It's an RBC enzyme disorder. It's an enzyme, the most common enzyme disorder in the world. So now I'm going to ask you somebody to read that. How many, how, how much uh, uh, people are affected in the world? 400 million. 400 million people, my friends, affected. So that is the impact is so huge, okay? Now let's look at an intrinsic defect. It's also two parts. It's got extravascular or intravascular hemolysis, okay? And so remember that sex link recessive, uh, most common enzyme uh, defective disorder in the world, 400 million people. Okay, coming back to epidemiology, 7.5%, again, 400 million. Um, Jewish people, Kurdish Jewish people, I think around 75% of the affected. And then African and Mediterranean descent, and there's some protection from the uh, plasmodium falciparum malaria for those people also. It's important to remember that, okay? Now, Clinical features. What is the first thing? Somebody read this really loud. Most uh, mostly asymptomatic. Mostly asymptomatic. Okay, and then recurring. Sometimes it's. Uh, I mean, you can have like recurring hemolytic crisis. Sometimes it comes and goes. Maybe. I mean, that's why I said that. Okay. You can have sudden onset of abdominal pain and back pain. You can have jaundice, and you can have transient splenomegaly. Okay. So these are episodic. I would say. Okay, and then recurrent severe infection, it can cause chronic granulomatous disease, which we will come back to later. So everybody got that. So, I mean, the one of the differential features of this is like, you cannot, I mean, it's a transient splenomegaly. Remember, all the other thing is like um, we talk about is uh, um, we got uh, so huge spleen, but this is a transient splenomegaly. Remember that, okay? And um, and then we have some triggers for this, which is also very important, like fever, beans, and drugs, and infection that could trigger causing the hemolytic uh, crisis. But again, only like in some situation it happens. Okay, remember that. Now, the most important, now we have to look and go is into RBC. Okay, there is the pentose phosphate pathway. We're going to take a look at it. You got glucose 6 phosphate, it's converted into 6 phosphogluconate, and the enzyme is what? Glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. This is where the problem is. It also converts NADP into NADPH, and this NADPH is uh, needed to convert this glutathione disulfide into a reduced form of glutathione, okay? Very, very important. So once you have this glutathione um, reduced form, that helps in the hydrogen peroxide, which is very damaging, right? These are like free radicals, um, and then it's converted into two water molecules, so the dam less damage to the uh, tissues and cells and all that. So everybody just kind of, let's go over again. Again, this could be going to go into pentose phosphate pathway in RBC, right? Glucose 6-phosphate is converted to 6-phosphogluconate. The major problem over here, the defect is what? Somebody tell me glucose. 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase efficiency. So NADPH is, a con is converted to NADPH? No. no. You need NADPH to convert glutathione disulfide. Majority of glutathione in the body is in this glutathione disulfide. It get reduced to glutathione, reduced form. You got to do two, 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 I mean disulfide, one is taken away, so you got reduced glutathione, which is essential, right? 
This hydrogen peroxide is very damaging, right? That should be converted into water molecules, so less damage. So that is what the, in a nutshell, if you look at it, that's where the damage is happening, okay? Now, like what happens, the main thing we need to remember out of this is like a fava beans, which is called favism. Why is that? Uh, we look in the history, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, okay, always uh, tells everybody don't eat beans. Maybe that has something to do with that at that time, okay? So what happens in Faba beans contains, I mean, it's actually, let's look at the uh, name Physia Faba, it contains Divsin and Isouramil, okay? That produce like a reactive oxygen species. Everybody know reactive oxygen or free radicals is kind of damaging to the cell and the tissue. And then you got something called superoxide dismutase enzyme that is convert this into hydrogen peroxide, right? Which is again, we know this is more damaging the tissue also. So if you don't have reduced glutathione, this hydrogen peroxide is going to accumulate, cause more damage, right? If you do have this, it's kind of converted into water and the damage is less. Okay, remember this is very, very important to, when we uh, talk about the favor of beans. Okay, but not all the people with the um, G6PD and favor of beans is going to be affected, especially, but it's affected when you have like fresh, when you eat fresh. Uh, fava beans. Okay. Now, when you talk about the other, like when you talk about the other problem, um, what are the other causes? Like, let's say, look at the infection. This is like triggers, right? What are the infections we can have? I'm going to write it up here. Infections, right? Somebody tell me what is the most common infections we can have? Hepatitis. Okay. Very common. Let's say like hepatitis. This becomes very complicated because, you know, you got hemolytic causes because it's a hemolytic anemia and then what happens is going to this, bilirubin will also go up. Can hepatitis also cause bilirubin to go up? Yes. Right? So there's like confusion. People can easily miss. That's why what do you have to do when you do the lab work? Always fractionate it to find out is a conjugated bilirubin or unconjugated. Hemolytic anemia, what kind of bilirubin do we have? Unconjugated. Unconjugated bilirubin. Okay, so hepatitis, what are the other uh, other uh, infections? Pneumonia, okay. All right, pneumonia. We can have CMV infection. And what is the other one? Typhoid also, typhoid fever. Okay, remember that. Those are the most common infections you can have, can cause this, okay. Now, what about the drugs? That's also important, right? Somebody tell me some of the drugs we have to worry about. It. I think everybody knows that. Somebody tell me. Anti-malarials. Anti-malarials, okay. I'm going to write anti-malarials. Okay, which anti-malarial? Primaquin. Primaquin is very common. Primaquin and pamaquin, okay. Primaquin, what are the other, other, uh, other ones? What are the drugs? Sulfonamides. Sulfonamides. Nitrofurantoin. Nitrofurantoin. Very common, right? Dapsone. For, yep. Dapsone. Dapsone. Okay, even Bactrim. Yeah. Okay, and the chemical. Naphthalene also can cause this, okay? Naphthalene. Remember that, okay. Now, you also can have like neonat jaundice also. Sometimes, you know, what mom eats or like oxidative stress. There's some report about naphthalene camphor balls in the clothes they use when you're a baby, right? And that can cause like oxidative stress and then that could be the trigger for hemolytic crisis. Everybody got that? Now look at the, let's look at the investigations. Begins. A lot of times it's asymptomatic, right? You might not. Unless you go through a crisis, then all this thing happen, right? When you have crisis, decrease hemoglobin and hematocrit. Everybody know that. What happened next? Hemolysis. You got the usual, I mean, in the crisis mode, right? There's a lot of hemolysis. Increase LDH, decrease afterglobin, and then increase... Con I mean, unconjugated bilirubin, right? Reticulocytes should go up too. 
Now, most important thing, you got peripheral smear, you got something called Heinz bodies, okay? In the hemoglobin, you got hemoglobin. Okay, out of this globin, they got like sulfhydryl group. That become because of the oxidative stress, what happens is it get polymerized. It polymerized and they, they form this Heinz bodies and it get attached to the membrane. Okay, once the membrane get attached to the membrane, what does the macrophages do in the screen and all that? They pluck it out. So that's why you have, what is it called? Somebody tell me that really loud. What is it called? White cells. White cell. remember that. And then Heinz bodies, everybody know how Heinz body formation and white cell. Most important thing, most important peripheral smear finding you will find, my friends, okay? Now, screening test, you can do fluorescent spot test, and if it is positive, then you do the confirmatory quantitative G6PD analysis, okay? And the treatment, main treatment is like avoid the triggers, okay? All this oxidative stress, and um, you only like, I mean, you can have like chronic hemolysis um, and uh, transfusion as needed, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, like when you talk about the uh, treatment, avoid the triggers, okay? Usually it's not, chronic hemolysis will not be there. Remember that, okay? It's usually what happens, it's like a transient, uh, only when the triggers happen, this happens. Remember that. So chronic, what happened in the chronic hemolysis picture? That's where the splenomegaly and all the other complications, gallstone and all that. So in this case, since there is no chronic hemolysis, there will not be, you know, large spleen or gallstone. This will be very absent, okay? Remember that's very, very important point right there. And then transfusion as needed also. And uh, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, you can supplement with the folate if you need to. So just summarize. One more time right here, again, the word is, it's an X-linked, more males, extravascular and intravascular, and then remember, 400 million people in the world affected, most common and same deficiency, my friend, okay? And then remember, recurrent hemolytic uh, crisis, transient splenomegaly, and you can have chronic granulomatous disease. The reason for that, because this NADPH is going to be formed a very less NADPH because of the deficiency. That is what causes chronic granulomatous disease. That's another very important point. Okay, just go to this RBC, and you got the, um, uh, I mean, glucose 6-phosphate is uh, converted into 6-phosphogluconate. What pathway is that? Pentose phosphate pathway. So we going go back and look at the pentose phosphate pathway. You got glucose 6-phosphate is converted into 6-phosphogluconate, and that's where we need the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. If you are this absent, you don't have NADPH. If you don't have NADPH, you got uh, glutathione disulfide in the body. This is the most of it. This need to be converted into glutathione is in the reduced form. What is glutathione reduced form does? This hydrogen peroxide, which is very damaging to the tissues, right? It's converted into two water molecules. So the damage is done. If you don't have this, you will not have this. More of this, it will damage. And always remember, Pythagoras and the fever bean. Why did he say like not the fever beans, okay? Because you got dipsine and isouracil, that's where you got oxygen free radical, and that is kind of because superoxide is better to convert into hydrogen peroxide, again it's damaging, right? If you don't have glutathione reductase form, this will accumulate more damage to the thing. And infection, always think about the hepatitis infection because you can have combined conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin and you can actually miss it, right? And then typhoid fever, look at drugs, anti-malaria is very common. And then sulfonamides, nitrofurantoin, we use for you treat UTI, dapsone, bactrim, and chemical naphthalene. And remember the neonatal jaundice, the uh, naphthalene camphor balls may be, the, um, may be implicated. And then when you have, again, uh, this is uh, sometimes only during the attack you will see this picture. Otherwise, patients can remain asymptomatic. Heinz bodies and uh, Heinz bodies are, you got hemoglobin in the hemoglobin, this globin. Um, globin is kind of, because of the oxidized stress, it can polymerize and it can form Heinz bodies which attach to the membrane and this macrophage is trying to pluck it out. Then you have white cells, screening test is rose and spot test, confirmatory is quantitative G6PD deficiency treatment, I think, avoid trigger, that's the most important thing. Again, 
the word is here chronic hemolysis picture is absent okay i just want to make that point one more time very clear because when you don't have you you don't have chronic hemolysis so what happens you will not have large spleen or you will not have gallstones in this picture always remember that thank you so much for watching uh, we'll be back with another presentation if you could subscribe to our channel it'll be very very helpful please help us out because it takes a lot of people's effort to make videos like this Again, thank you so much.